Thakur, the CEO of Change Partners International. Mr. Thakur, the marketing director. Mr. Okafo is making his way. So the topic of this um, dialogue is reducing carbon emission. And um, we all know the world currently generates about 50 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent, about 30 billion, 45% reduction by 2030, and hopefully um, get close to zero by 2050 to reduce to avoid a 1.5 degree warming or uh, a 2 degrees warming at the worst case scenario. But the current trajectory, uh, except for when COVID happened and we were all forced to stay at, at home, is that that trend seems to be going up. Um, and um, it doesn't seem to be abated. Our activities, um, predominantly the way we use energy, both um, industrially and at home, and the way we get around, the way we make things, the way we feed ourselves and our uh, agriculture, all contribute to uh, global emissions. Now, I'm going to start this conversation with uh, my brother from Uganda, because uh, you've traveled uh, really far to be here. Um, and, uh, so, so Africa, um, I think we heard um, the uh, president of uh, African Producers, and he just highlighted a very important point, um, which is the point that um, six, 600 million people living in energy poverty, majority um, in Africa. Um, Uganda happens to have, according to Oxfam, some of the worst numbers, uh, where that is concerned, um, it, it, you know, significant percentages. You know, should we even be having this conversation in Africa? Um, you guys, Uganda generates about five million metric ton, um, so which is really infinitesimal. Africa, the total generates under under one one me, one million one billion metric ton. Um, is this you know a conversation that we should be bothered by um, in Africa reducing emissions? in the context of energy poverty, um, cooking fuels, people are still using poor, um, poor cooking fuel. Is this something that should be a concern for us? I think you should start this conversation by that bit of a motivation why we need to be having this conversation. Uh, thank you so much. A brilliant question and a good one. And the, I'm from Ghana. Yeah, sure. <laughs> It is, it is. It's an interesting topic to, to discuss. Uh, but, but before I come to your question, you know, allow me to introduce myself properly. Because the MC here was kind of uh, overcoming delegations and Uganda was not listed. So I feel I should be able to tell the people here that Uganda is here and we're here for a purpose. We're here for a purpose and be able to meet together we go to net zero emissions. That's what the, for me the discussion should go along that side. And once it's on net emissions, then we are together and it's a real time to discuss this. And why are we doing this? Because we need to industrialize, we need to have our people get employment, we need to have production, we need to have our economic growth. However, we should do it sustainably. If we don't do it right now, if we don't discuss this topic of reducing emissions at this moment, in the next 10 to 15 years, it's going to be very hard for us to, to talk about our natural capital, our natural resources that we have. We shall repeat them. And definitely, there are challenges to this. One of the challenges I will tell you is the challenges of uh, orientated around social capital and economy, social economic and, and the and, and development of issues. Social, because we want to have things. We want to consume much at, 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 at a factory given time. We want consumption. Our emission, you've had tried from the, the, the other presentations, is less than 4%. You know? So, what is our contribution? First, let's look at the consumption side. Are we consuming too much? If we boost consumption, would that have a negative impact on Africa? 
It might be long. Even when we think that, I won't serve much. I own, I'm a teacher. I tell my students, why do you have five suits, ten suits in your world? Why don't you have one? That is mission. This is going to impact to the other people that we're talking about that are telling us to do, you know, industries in Europe, industries in China, industries in America. If we are this consumption, however, if we come back to the energy, our production, and like I told you, Uganda, we have gone to production of oil and less energy. Africa is going to have a high demand. The market is here for our oil products. Look, I traveled from Uganda. I had to go through the East. I had to come here. Suppose we had a railway network coming from Uganda. This is market for oil products. And the population is growing. Next 50, next 20, 30 years. Our population is going to be high, the demand for our energy products is going to be big. Like I said before, we should be conscious of the climate change and the development impact that we're putting on our mother nature. So and that's I, why we think this. So, so thank you very much for those points and, that, and for motivating this conversation by saying yes, we ought to think about um, reducing emissions. I'll come back to interrogate the point you made about uh, market for our oil and gas. But let me just quickly go to Professor um, Emor um, to ask about Professor Emor. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Professor Emor, yes. To ask about, we, we're talking about em emissions. What, in your view, are Africa's biggest sources of emissions and low hanging fruits that we can sort of tackle if we want to make a contribution? to a very quick, tangible contribution to emissions reduction that is measurable. And how do we measure that to make sure that, you know, we can, we, we can make that case that on the global scene that we're making progress. Okay, can, you, can you address that question a little bit? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. And you can start by introducing yourself properly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Igor Obio. I'm the director of the Institute for Physics and Ecology. Uh, it is not usual to bring those two topics together. <laughs> but uh, in my later days in the university, I thought that if the world will overcome the global change problem, the greatest challenge we are facing is that of ecological uh, I mean, managing the ecological change that we can see, and that physics and other technologies have a strong role to play in this. So the institute is actually looking at the framework for bringing science and technology together to solve the problems of global change in general, and in this specific instance, climate change. I have been involved in addressing emission inventories since 1990. And I have walked through the system from that period to now as a researcher uh, in Nigeria. And uh, based uh, at the Bakuna Oro University lately, we, our team was the first. That's within the Africa, within the Africa, as well as within the Latin American region to produce emission inventories in 1992. Look at cigarettes again. Yes, yes, sir. And so, when we're speaking of emissions, of course, uh, many people believe that Africa has very little contribution, which may be true in some cases, but not true for Nigeria. Because in the last, uh, the, third, I said, the third report we have submitted, our emissions trend show that. We, our per capita emissions is already reaching 3.8 tons per person. If you look at, look at that in terms of the uh, range of developing, I mean, developed countries and countries uh, in transition, you will see that most of the countries are within 8 tons per person. Only few countries exceed 8 tons of CO2 emissions per capita. And so 
The other issue, of course, is that the region has a high, one of the highest population growth rates, and we are still at the best level in terms of consumption. So if we are going to challenge ourselves to move towards higher consumption, it means that we have the nation going to stay us in the face. And there is no way we can do that without addressing the emission reduction. I have in this uh, small uh, notes I am in with me, you know, uh, identified challenge, challenge. Uh, in the Nigeria sector, two key sources are there. The energy sector and the land use change and forestry sector, as, of course, as well as uh, agriculture, which now forms their producing sector. The other two sectors, industries and the wealth sectors, are not as strong. But the challenge is that each of these contributes something. But I would like to take a minute, but I don't know how much time I have, to address the main challenge we have. The challenge we have is not that we cannot solve problems in terms of investments, but not all problems are solvable in terms of just bringing finance and addressing you know, financing imports. Because that's what we do when we are talking about technologies for emission reduction. Either we bring in solar or we bring in biomass technology, they are all important. And the economy of our region is not strong. The economy is becoming seafood. As you bring in this, it looks good on the surface that, oh, we are bringing in a lot of solar technology, but it doesn't address economic sustainability because you have to face the challenge of debt as you are going in if you are not careful. So my message, principally, is that we have my students develop the means to which we can bring the universities and other research institutions in our region as partners for development. And these partners is not just to do what we call oh, publish or perish, which is what we have been doing. We must address proprietary research ourselves instead of waiting for others to do so and send us the technology or we love you for how you can give us the technology. So I have uh, a wide range of issues I have raised in my uh, notes here, which I have shared with the Secretary. I will, I will give you a chance yes. to go through those wide range of issues yes. in a short while. Okay. But thank you. I think the prop deserves a round of applause yes. for that submission, particularly that last point around uh, our academia cannot just be doing publish or perish. We have to contribute something to society, to economic development, and to the market. Thank you very much, Prof, for that, for that background. Going from Prof, I will jump to Ghana. Now, uh, employment to our people and ensuring that our people get the best now. However, Coming back to the question, is it time for us to discuss the natural deficiencies? I will tell you, yes, this is the right time. Because if we don't, we are going to be doomed. We are being affected both South African brothers, in particular, that's why it's emissions. For me, when you talk of reducing emissions, right? But I want us to talk about net emission change. Um, and you're looking at a cost of somewhere between 9 and 15 billion. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about Ghana's NDC and how you were trying to target in Ghana? The president at COP said something about 20 million trees, talked about um, developing, uh, you know, uh, um, decarbonizing the oil and gas sector. Could you tell us a little bit more about what Ghana is doing um, and how you got to that cost of 9 to 15 billion? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity for Ghana to be part of uh, this uh, very important and leading uh, summit. Uh, I've just loved it yesterday when I joined in the afternoon the discussion and continue to love it. Yes, I, I think you are right. Uh, issues of uh, 
climate change here and all that. But I just want us to go back a little to talk a little bit about uh, whether we need to be discussing these uh, issues of climate change and why the NDPs and all that. I think the answer again is yes, as has been indicated. Uh, we have to develop and to do that, we also need to be mindful of what is happening around us because we are not living in we live in a global village and whatever is happening elsewhere is affecting us. Uh, we are told that most of these things that we are talking about never happened now. It happened long time ago and as was mentioned in the earlier presenter, uh, the pre-industrial uh, revolution brought about this whole thing and if we continue to behave the same way, I'm sure the next generation is going to also sit and be talking about this thing. That is why there is a need to discuss it. First, the other thing is that we are mostly the people who are affected because the continent is quite vulnerable. Uh, I'm sure we are all uh, aware of what happens when there's rains around. We are all aware of when it doesn't rain. We, we are so vulnerable that we can't even uh, uh, cater for these issues. So there's a need to uh, be talking about this. Now coming back to the, uh, the nationally determined contribution, uh, it's not cut out, uh, out of stone. I based on a, a, a certain uh, a international convention that is the Paris Agreement, and as we are all aware, the uh, uh, Article Four of it spells out that we need to be submitting the uh, the NDCs. We initially submitted an NDC of about twenty two point six billion, uh, where we were looking at. Uh, Happened into domestic uh, funding of about 6.3 billion and also 8.3 from international. Having implemented these NDCs, however, we realized that there was no way. Because, like also mentioned, and we are most of us are aware, the international fundings are not coming. Because we are promising 100 billion every year, it's never coming. And within our own setup, we are also having challenges mobilizing the US financing. So there is a need for us. During uh, our review, which we recently uh, submitted to the UNFCCC, uh, has been updated, like you did mention, uh, 9.3 billion and uh, 15.6, uh, 15.5 billion uh, to, uh, to be mobilized for to address issues of climate change. And how did we come by these things? Is out of experience and based on the scientific uh, reason. Uh, because the initial one that uh, we did, out of the Paris and uh, Paris uh, Accord and Agreement, we had to carry all the all of us. I'm sure did that. Harry put together this document, but uh, after implementing it for a while, we got to know that there are certain things that we need to look at, especially what is Africa looking for. We are looking at issues of adaptation. We can't be resilient because, like I did mention, drought and flood are something we can so much avoid. So we needed to really look at our NDCs and we have our 14, uh, 47 programs of action that we want to implement. So we quantified them and based on that we came out with uh, this course. But to be able to do that, I think it's also very important, as I mentioned, uh, we need to develop because the population is growing. And I'm sure uh, if I, I'm not wrong, Nigeria is now heading towards uh, about 200 and 30 or 250 uh, million. And I'm sure Ghana has moved from 20 to 25, and currently we are 30 million. It tells you that we are increasing, and therefore there is a need to take advantage of it to create more decent and additional uh, job opportunities. This is one of the things that you are craving for. This is one of the things that is comforting us to become much poorer. Because if you look at the SDGs, go one and go two, is looking at making sure that we can uh, alleviate uh, poverty and say no to hunger. So these are some of the things that we look at and re quantify uh, our NDCs. And I'm sure if we get it done for, uh, we'll be able to. Now, in the revised NDCs, we have intentionally looked at homegrown strategies. And one of the key Thing that we are looking at, I'm sure uh, uh, Prof. mentioned issues of debt 
as being one of the challenges we shouldn't just have a place in debt. We're looking at the strategy to look at whether... Could we, could we come back to you to talk about that debt question? Uh, but I want to get some words from the other oh. panelists. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so I will come to Kai. Uh, you are a consultant that advises uh, a lot of governments as well as you know uh, private sector actors who are working towards reducing emissions. Um, uh, most of them in their businesses and whatnot. How much of a change do you think we are getting, or is it just lip service? Yes, of 
supply chain as well, you know, and, and, and all those. So in the point of building a performance management system, it has various capacity, it's meant to identify those relevant and material areas, it's meant to identify the opportunities, and it's meant to you're meant to identify the next step of the KPI system, which we try to build that aggregate into. Governance is a big part of the Starting from the board, from boards, so at the top, and you know, embedding PSA into this management sheet is important. So we do see clients growing in those, you know, because there are lots of incentives. Investors are losing capital. You know, uh, the, the access to capital is a requirement. We're seeing growing ESG patients, we're seeing green bonds. You know, uh, uptake, you know, and there's just a lot of brand reputation. Most companies, the valuation of the, the intangible part of the valuation is so big, so reputation factors. You know, we're seeing employees, talent, you know, the new generation, they care. They just don't want to work for a company that is giving huge delegation to the whole community. They also want to work in organizations that have profit and they take it seriously. Customers keep their exam. So there's just a lot of external pressure. And we're seeing growing regulation. You know, uh, there's one that will be a big changer. IFRS has um, um, you know, published exposure that that will require companies to disclose on their strategy, their governance, the metrics. So it's revolutionary, right? Revolutionizing as an accelerated performance. You know, when you take a step back and go two years ahead. And we're also seeing collaboration. There's on SDC, the private sector I mentioned, the MSCG, the same partnership on capital needs. You know, so I, I think they're on the right track. You know, and the external pressures and incentives Thank you for that, that response. So, so I think it's a, a very uplifting point to know that there's a lot of efforts um, in the private sector and the incentives are aligned um, to making sure that um, we go in the direction of, um, of emissions reduction. As, and as our colleague from Ghana also rightly pointed out, you know, they, they came to a point in Ghana where they realized that, oh, we set these very ambitious goals, but um, and they really, as realistic, and they had to re rejig their plans. And I, I want to ask, um, um, Mr. Um, God, I, I, I have to remind myself. Um, Akachuku, Akachuku, my apologies, Akachuku. Um, so I want to ask Akachuku. So uh, one of the accusations that have been leveled against um, the a lot of the current NDCs, the state consultants. Um, and um, most of the time, you know, it's really just cut to paste, you know, of what we wrote for Nigeria, we we'll write it for Ghana, and we we'll write it for, um, you know, how, how valid is this, and how much, you know, as have we, you know, domesticated, you know, the NDCs that we have, and the commitments that we are making on a local level based on the, you know, the research that you're doing, and the work that you're doing. change problem and the need for Africa to either decarbonize and uh, look at factors. So can we speak closer to the microphone because those are the back end of your screen. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's better. So I was saying that I would like to drop a few things that, That's we, okay. that I would like to look more closely at um, because this is an important topic. Uh, if Africa would uh, become a producing continent, not a consuming continent, with our population growing in 2030, 2050, five African countries will be contributing half of the world's population. 
that is Nigeria, Tanzania, Cambodia, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And if we, if we want to produce and not be a consuming nation, we we'll have to think about the energy to drive the growth, the production that we need to do. We have enormous gas resources. Um, and Prof mentioned uh, a sector that uh, I would like to touch on. He mentioned science and technology, the role that science and technology will play. Unfortunately, uh, many times when we come to forums like this, we shy away from color technology and resources that we have that can enable us. It's quite interesting to note that the Ukraine crisis um, is getting Europe to think about nuclear, again, to have everything on nuclear. Take an example, France, 70% of its uh, electricity is supplied by nuclear. Unfortunately, Germany, that is leading the uh, solar wind uh, revolution around the world, took a bit off from nuclear in the 80s, not because the science and technology of nuclear is not right, but because of politics. The SDP at the time wanted to win elections. There were protests in Germany and they decided that we would have to win elections and move away from nuclear because of the uh, problems uh, with Chernobyl. So, if we want to decarbonize, if Africa wants, because when we talk about natural resource and the growth that we want to have in the, in the uh, natural resource extractive industry, energy is a key component to driving that growth. You can't do the level of uh, extraction that you need without core energy, not solar energy, I'm not talking about solar panels and all that, they are beautiful. But when we want to drive growth, we must have to look closely and think also about our energy security. We have the uranium in Africa, and interestingly, when you talk about decarbonizing the global energy system, you will realize that most of the minerals and metals that will help us decarbonize the global energy system, you need over 500 uh, percent demand of those resources for wind, for uh, solar, and all of that. And most of those deposits are in Africa. So if we are going to mine those resources, if we are going to produce for Africa, if we are going to lead, feed our population, and do all that we need to do, core energy, serial based load is, is, uh, is, is needed. I am happy, I guess Prof is a professor, is a, is a, a professor of physics. At one time in 2018, I, I was invited by the Russian government to the latest nuclear facility. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, so could, could you, could you, um, no, I, I want to, I will let you make the point, but could you, um, so could you skip to the third uh, point you want to make, because we are running out of time. I will, I will come to that, I will come to your question, I haven't forgotten, but we need to set the tone appropriately. But we don't have a lot of time yet, so okay. you just skip to the core. Thank you. You make the point that we need, we, we um, need to, different technologies. We need to understand what level of energy we want to produce, so that we can think about the decarbonization and, and the climate uh, resources that we yeah. have. So, so I will I will leave that point for a moment because I want to. I need to answer your question. Now. Okay. All right. When it comes to the development, the drafting of our NDCs, unfortunately, we hire experts from abroad to design it, and they impose on our African states ideas of how we can continue our dependence on technologies that are produced. It's high time that we're looking was engage our uh, experts, scientific technology uh, technologies to develop NDCs that are suitable, that are appropriate for Africa, 
based on the resources and the technology and capacity that we have developed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chico. Um, and again, the audience clearly likes, likes the points you made. Um, so and the, those, are, those are great points. But I'd like to get to the finance question because um, you, we, the, all this, you talk about, um, you talk about, okay, we need base load and energy, and that's if you listen to the vice president, that's a point you will hear uh, repeated often. Um, and, but, but then there's a question of, okay, so that, and you know, Uganda made the point, um, everybody made the point, but then there's a question of the IOCs um, who have the technology for exploration and drilling are no longer investing as much in Africa. Many of them are divested. You've had a situation where even the little investments that is going into new frontier projects and new projects I'm going to places like Saudi Arabia where it costs zero to thirty dollars to produce per barrel. So nobody is going to a place where it's expensive to produce per barrel. And if you want to go offshore where the opportunities are, um, it's expensive. So that's the first point. The second point is if you started to uh, find new projects that will sort of um, get you that energy, some of these projects take ten years to build. It probably will by the time you are commissioning and sending your first oil or first gas out of that project, um, it's 2030, 2032. And um, Spain's NBC commitments have, have gotten to um, have, have, have come to the point where they, they, they are getting to net zero. So so who is going to buy the oil and gas that you produce? Um, I wanna uh, you require to try to address that question a little bit and then I'll move to uh, my colleague from Uganda who started to motivate this point. Okay, so let me start by saying even on a global scale, there are different perspectives in this. I mean, yes, Africa doesn't emit a lot, and you know, there is that just transition. So we've, we're running out of time, yeah. so, so I'll just you make this point and everybody will make the last point. Okay, okay. So, 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 you know, there is... Okay, so there is, you know, that dilemma of Africa being so resource and well, you know, with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, big field opportunities and potential to and potential to use this to help you know, achieve accelerated economic growth and development and provide cheap, affordable you know, um, energy, for example, to, 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 to Africans and as well you know, meet um, you know, uh, other demands. But the thing is, you know, you, we, we, need to, we need to develop a transition plan that works for us. So let zero starts with making that bold ambition. Then you now look at your pathways, right? So the short term, and you have to look at the external ecosystem and the global context. So for, for the short to medium term, fossil fuel still remains relevant for us. And we're seeing with the Ukraine crisis, like, like he mentioned, you know, Going back, it's a bit of a setback where they're opening up coal plants, nuclear facilities, and all that. So, but the thing is, in the medium term, gas is a good alternative for us. Yes, you mentioned how long it takes to do the exploration, but you know, there is the potential for hydrogen in the long term. So, you can still go ahead and do the exploration and look at all those spin offs. Our renewable energy potential. Kenya produces most of the electricity from hydro. We do have hydro, we do have solar as well. Then you know in the long term, the, 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 the renewable energy. So you have to map out the transitions looking at the whole value chain. Because for example, for fossil fuel, the automobile uh, industry is going to move forward. By 2040, they wouldn't produce combustible engines. They're moving to EVs. So we don't produce. So even if we say we're going to continue producing fossil fuel, 
we also we, and we end up you know becoming a dumping ground for those cars. We don't even produce pepper. So we have to look at Africa continental free trade agreement, try to industrialize, try to have value addition for the resources that feed into renewable energy, the 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 EVs, you know, all those mines and and, and, and just make sure we maximize and create a homegrown solution that works for Africa that is just for us, creates those jobs, the much needed jobs, and, and, it, and helps you know, um, improve the quality of life for our people. Thank you very much, Brookhaya. I just, I really wish I could get to all the speakers, but I, we're really under pressure to wrap up the session. So I'll just make one, uh, okay, so just wrap up, okay. So I just wanna ask one, Final question, just to motivate, add something to uh, the Ghanaian uh, gentleman's wrap up point, which is the debt question. Africa is in a lot of debt. The, uh, is there a case to be made for some of that debt being exchanged, being forgiven for, in exchange for us, you know, uh, putting some of the limited resources we have into climate um, finance? Um, so that's one question I'd like you to tackle while you are answering your question, and then I'll give the other students a chance to just say one final concluding thought. Yeah, th thank you. That's great. Since uh, I'm not sure we will continue to do uh, debt forgiving a bit like like we did, because I'm sure we are all aware of the challenges we are facing. So I think that is why we need to take advantage of uh, the innovation that currently exists. So what, for example, Ghana is trying to do is looking at test swap where carbon credits that we develop, because definitely, I'm sure all the African countries will be able to uh, have in excess of their requirements. We can use that as a swap for our debt. So that is one key thing that we're trying to uh, do in all that. Then the other thing is that we need to encourage the private sector to come on board. Then the debt will not be on the books of government, because for example, I'm sure uh, like any other country, Ghana, for example, is looking at 80% uh, to GDP, and I'm sure others are also struggling in that sense. So if we can do this debt swap, get the private sector to come on board, provide the needed support, and bring them together, I'm sure they will be able to absorb this thing on our behalf. Thank you very much. Very good, point, sir. Um, my thank you, sir. Two points. One, net emission. Africa, we shall continue to emit, but let's also best in absorption, carbon absorption strategies. Two, Africa will have a comparative advantage in non-smoke star industries, toward them and the rest. Let's invest there and get money out. Three, let's be ready to negotiate. Yesterday someone made a very strong statement here. You only get what you negotiate for, you don't get what you deserve. When you go to the negotiation meeting, Let's negotiate, let's negotiate, let's get what we deserve. Thank you so much. Excellent. So much. Thanks for being concise. Professor. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my final word is that all countries of the world are in one economic mess on the other and they're trying to get out. If our development is only going to wait for them to support us, for us to develop, we will not get out. And so my thesis is that we have all it takes in terms of the dynamic population of young people to address from the bottom up approach some measures of technology development that can get to the market from within our shores. And then we add this to the Important technology we are bringing to investment. That way, a few African countries could, in the next four decades, you know, reach what I may address as a one trillion dollar economy or annual budget within a short time. And that is the only time we can start thinking about how to decouple from debts. If we don't do so, whether the debts are forgiven today. And Nigeria is a typical example where debts have been forgiven and we are back. Oh. So we will still get back. Oh. So we have very strong opportunities. My institute has the wherewithal 
and we are supporting research to commercialization programs. We have the way we are, we are ready to work with any government or any institution that is willing to partner with us to get these kind of programs off to the market. Thank you very much, Professor Ingo. So with that, we come to the conclusion of this session. And the key points, we, it will be in net reduction. We have to uh, we have to take emissions reduction seriously. And in terms of technologies, we have to diversify technologies. Uh, the truth is that whether whether we like it or not, the reality of the energy transition is that the market for fossil fuel is going to be limited in the near future. We have to be ready for that future. Thank you very much um, for being a great audience. Thank you to my panelists. Uh, we'll, we'll close it there. Bye, everyone.